Okay, so we're gonna do a little demo. I had a video I'll, I'll post as well. This video, if you didn't already see it, covers if you're trying to look up a p-value from a t-statistic in the table in a book, um, it uses a book table and shows you how you might do that. Appendix B in your book has all those types of tables. I do not tend to prefer the use of those tables for a variety of reasons. One, they tend to be a bit cumbersome to kind of try to look up the values. Two, the only reason they were ever included in books to begin is because computers used to not be widely accessible. So a professor would have to go in and generate all the values on their computer and give students a handout of these tables so students could look things up. You have a computer now, it's a requirement for this course, and using your own computer to look up a p-value from a t-statistic will give you a much more accurate and precise value. Because as you'll notice, if you look in the table in your book, it can't include all possible degrees of freedom. It can't include all possible values for alpha. It, and so if you have different things, being able to input those, those different pieces of information you need, critical to be able to evaluate these statistics. So it is better to just know how to use a program to generate these values. And because I realize that might be difficult, I have created for you two calculators that help with getting p-values from your t-statistics. So the first one should look familiar. This was the calculator we've used, the Excel statistical workbook that you use when you did a normal distribution function. So when you wanted to go from Z to P or from X to P, we could do that with normal distributions. Now this worked for Z scores. It also worked for the Z test, so long as you use the standard error when you were doing it. Now, in the same way, you can do this for T statistics. So I have a chart here for T, the studentized T to turn a T value into a P value. What two things do I need to know to turn a T into a P? I need to know my T statistic. So for example, if I computed a T statistic of 2.5, I would put the T value there and I need to know my degrees of freedom. So imagine this was a one sample test and I had 25 people. I would have 24 degrees of freedom. I would put that here. And here I now get the one tailed and two tailed P values for this. So this can compute those statistical values for you, no problem. Now, this will also work if you have negative T values to get your one tail and two tail P values for those correctly. So you can put in negative or positive values. You'll notice the only thing that shifts here is what's the area left and what's the area right. Because if you have a positive value, the tail is on the right. If you have a negative value, the tail is on the left. But mostly what we want here are going to be one or two tailed P values. The one tail P value will correspond to the tail. The two tail value will be twice as, long, twice as big as the one tail value because it's looking at both sides of the distribution. So it splits that in half. So this is, and this is why often two tail we say are more conservative. So notice if I had a value that was very nearly significant, um, a one tail test, this would be significant because that is less than 0 0.05, which is our often our common threshold, right? Sometimes your book will tell you use 0 0.01, pay attention to the instructions as far as whether you should do a one tail or two tail test and pay attention to the instructions as far as what alpha value you're using for comparison for a determination of significance. Here, I'm using 0 0.05 as a common convention, and based on that convention, this would be significant, but this, a two-tail test, would not be significant. So the evidence would not be sufficient if I was using this more critical standard of evaluation. You should always default to two-tail unless the book tells you to do a one-tail. So this is a way you can use that calculator I built for you to easily get T values into P values. Now, you can also use the t-test help calculator I built to actually solve problems from the book. So this is a place where you can input information. So for example, your book often gives you things like sum of squares, sample size, um, and the hypo hypothetical values. So if we look at an example from your book, um, let me pick a problem here from chapter nine. <clears throat> so if we look back at a problem from chapter nine, we can look at a problem where it says to compute something like in number 15, where Weinstein, McDermott, and Rodiger did this test on memory. So in this problem, it says the overall average was mu 
with n equals 16 students had a mean of 78.3 and a standard deviation of 8.4, use a two-tailed test with alpha 0.01 to determine whether answering the questions while studying produced higher exam scores. So doing this, what I need to know are what is my sum of squares or remember, sum of squares is used to get variance, which is used to get standard deviation. So your book often gives you sum of squares and I know it can be difficult to backtrack. So I put that as the default input value. But in this problem, it gives us the standard deviation already. Well, if you're already given the standard deviation, you can go ahead and type it in here. It won't backtrack to these values, but it will work for the rest of the calculations. However, if you save that, you will have deleted the equation I had for you. So notice here is an input. There's no formula. Here is a variance that's calculated from this divided by this. Because remember, a variance is a sum of squares divided by a degree of freedom. So that's what it's saying right here. That's what we're doing. We're dividing this cell by this cell to get the variance. And then the standard deviation is nothing more than the square root of the variance, right? So these are just using those mathematical calculations already programmed for you. So I can type here, and as long as I undo what I type after I'm done, or you know, just don't save the changes to the file, or re-download it to use it next time, you know, any of those things, just make sure you realize if you type in the gray boxes, you're deleting some kind of equation, which means that it won't work as it was intended to work in the future. So don't save those changes, but you can still type in there. So in this problem, I could say, okay, well, my standard deviation was 8.4. I'm just going to put that in. My sample size was 16. Okay. And notice it gives me the DF right from that. This says I want to do a two tail test. So two tails and I want an alpha of 0.01. This says that the mean for my sample is 78.3, capital M in your book, which is APA style, and that mu, which is the expected value, is 73.4. So when I do this, here's what I get. I get all the values computed for me, the T critical value, the T obtained value, right? So, So what we see here is that this T critical is bigger than my T obtained, right? And we also see that our P value 0 0.03 is bigger than 0 0.01. So this is greater than alpha and this is less than T critical. Those things always are gonna match up. So if your T obtained is not as big as your T critical, then the result is not significant. Similarly, you can evaluate significance as it's most commonly done by comparing your P value to alpha. P value here, 0 0.03, rounding to two decimal places, is greater than 0 0.01. Therefore, this is not statistically significant. We can't conclude based on a two-tailed test with an alpha of 0 0.01 that, in fact, answering the questions produced higher exam scores based on this information. So if we had done a 0 0.05 alpha, we would have concluded it was significant. So, for example, if I put in here 0 0.05, my T critical changes, my T obtained is now larger than my T critical, and my P value is now smaller than my alpha value. So if you have a problem to solve, you can put the information straight into these calculators. And if you notice, I've made a one sample, an independent sample, and a related sample version for you. So you can do this um, either with raw data, you know, if you have raw data, you can run it in JASP or you can use the, the Excel videos that I show how to do a t-test with data, which is like where you have a columns of numbers. You can use the data analysis tool pack, if you remember, to do those types of tests. You can also do that in the other Excel file I gave you if you wanted to, where you can put in data here and it will compute t-tests for you over here. Um, but it's probably easier to just use the data analysis tool pack or JASP if you have a data set. And it's easier to use this to turn a T into a P or to use this workbook I built for you for T tests specifically if you're trying to solve from a set of values given. Now, we could go through and solve these by hand, right? So what is a one sample t-test? And by hand here, I'm gonna type the values into Excel, but it's the same idea, like if you were gonna type it into a calculator, right? So the t-test, if you remember, is what? A one sample t-test is the sample mean minus the population mean, which is the expected value, 
And then we divide all of that by the standard error. And the standard error going to make this look a little better here for you. The standard error is what? The standard error is for a one sample for the right we're talking about the standard error of the mean here. So this is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, the sample size, right? So that's what would go in this bottom here. So this is sample mean can be written x bar commonly in statistics, right? With the x with the bar over it. Your book often uses just capital M, which is APA style for uh, mean, that's how you abbreviate it in APA. A population mean is gonna be given to you, it's either gonna say it's the expected value or that you're gonna get that symbol for mu, right? So this is what you're gonna do to get this. So here, what do we have? Our equation, our sample mean was 78.3. Our expected value was 73.4. We're gonna divide all of that by Standard deviation, 8.4, divided by the square root of n, 16. And notice here, 2.33 is exactly what we got here. So, I mean, you could type these all into a calculator or try to solve by hand. Uh, this is doing the same thing. It's just pre-programmed for you. All right. So you can get T values from the descriptive statistics, like the mean and SD, if they're given to you. And this will get you P values. If you already have the T statistic, you can use the other calculator to get the P value straight from it. You can also use the link I provided several times. GraphPad both has the ability under continuous data to do T tests. You can do it straight away, a one sample T test or a T test to compare two means. So if we were gonna do this one sample T test from the book, we have the mean, the SD and the sample size. So if we look at our test over here, the mean for our sample was 78.3, standard deviation was 8.4, sample size was 16. Our hypothetical mean value, the expected value was 73.4. We can now calculate our test, which gives us all the statistics. Here's T of 2.33 on 15 degrees of freedom, which is exactly what we got here. And here is our two-tail p-value, 0.0340 as it rounds. And that's exactly what this would round to, 0 0.0340, if you were going to round to that location. So notice you're getting the same answers. You can use GraphPad. You can use Excel. Now, this also had the option back here to do uh, two means, which would be the independent or the related. So you can do the unpaired t-test is the independent, and the paired t-test is the related. So those options are both in here as well. And if you're just trying to get a p-value, you can do that by using the statistical distribution function, where you have the option to get a p-value from z, t, f, r, or chi-square. And all you need to know then is your t-value. For this test, it was 2.33 repeating on 15 degrees of freedom. We can compute p, and there's that same p-value once again. Now notice, GraphPad will only give you a two-tailed p-value, so you'd have to convert that into one tail if you're going to use GraphPad, so pay attention to that. Right. So if you wanted to make this a one tail p-value, you'd have to half this number. Right. So take that and divide by two. But my calculator can give you one or two tail. So that might be some of the strengths of those. Hopefully this is helpful in trying to solve some computations from your book and to find p-values from t-statistics. Remember, it's the same idea as z. The only thing that changes is you need to know not just the test statistic, but the degrees of freedom. Because if I change the df term, that will change my p-value. So if I only have two degrees of freedom, this is no longer significant. If I have 200 degrees of freedom, this is significant. So remember that t distribution changes its shape as a function of df. Hence, the p-values are different when the df changes for the same value of t. All right. Hopefully that helps.